Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, we got a really exciting, <clears throat> I think, uh, and compelling story to share with you today. Um, joining me today is uh, Carlos Bossi. Carlos is the CEO of Datalier. Uh, he's a trusted advisor to great data minds. And on a personal note, he's a very valued friend and a talented uh, colleague. So Carlos, thank you for joining. Welcome. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. It's great, great to be here this morning. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see your face again. Yeah, <laughs> can't, wait to get, yeah. can't wait to get face to face again. Yeah. So, so you do have a, kind of a compelling story to, to tell here, Carlos. Um, maybe could you start and give us a little background and context to the, the engagement that you did? Yeah, so, so you know, at DataLayer, we, uh, we do, uh, you know, data engineering and data architecture work. And, um, and we've been uh, engaged with uh, Connect for Health Colorado uh, for, for quite some time. In fact, uh, we were there essentially at the beginning, which was back in uh, late 2012. And, um, and uh, uh, essentially, they decided uh, to start to look at uh, going to the cloud a couple of years ago. So uh, essentially, we, we started to work with uh, them and various other uh, vendors and, and people who were involved and, and, and to help them make that plan and move to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so at Datalayer, we, you know, we've done, uh, uh, I don't know, I'd say in the last three years or so, uh, most of what we do is build big databases or big data warehouses in the cloud. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a natural thing for us to, to handle the, the data architecture and data engineering part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so what in in the case of Connect for Colorado, what was what was the motivator for them to go cloud? Yeah. So, so they uh, they when they initially built the system, uh, and of course, if uh, just so everybody's familiar with Connect for Health Colorado, it's Obamacare essentially in Colorado. So there was a mandate, you know, back in I don't know 2011, 2012 to to put this system together. And essentially, at the time we put it together, they they needed a, a federal uh, a data center to house the data in because of their requirements. So mm -hmm. they housed it in one of the the, the primary contractor uh, was CGI, who won the won the initial bid, and so they housed it in uh, in CGI's federal data center down in Arizona. Uh, essentially, they came to a point where a couple things happened. Uh, I think that contract was going to going to be going to finish and either need to be renegotiated or something new put in place. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, the thought was that if we're going to make a change, well, why not look at making a change over to the cloud? And uh, because uh, it'll give us, uh, give them a lot more flexibility, agility, uh, maybe bring some development in house, uh, be able to do more okay. uh, as opposed to being housed in the vendors data center. So, so uh, they started to look at that. Uh, a, a CIO came in at the time, uh, a new CIO who who had that idea, Kelly Guthner, and um, and then also uh, uh, you know there was a there was a lot of things that came together I guess at the same time to 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 make this happen and to make them think about doing it. Kind of a tipping point, <laughs> inflection point. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and Connect for Health has a a difficult, uh, it's not like a private business where uh, a private business might decide over to go over to the cloud and, and do it a little bit at a time or do it their own way. They don't have the ability or the, the authority to do it their own way. Um, they actually have governing bodies like CMS who, and, and other, other federal agencies that oversee them. Mm -hmm. And they have to get authority to make a change like that. Okay. And it's a lot of work, uh, uh, a lot of audits, a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, a lot of things for them to do to get the uh, to get the authority. Mm -hmm. so there's a big compelling interest in getting it only once, right? Uh, like for example, I wouldn't want to do it today, then six months from now do it again uh, because of the cost and and the time it takes. So, and essentially what they're doing is they're asking to change the security boundary of the data. Once the security boundary of the data changes, that authority must be provided by those governing bodies. Oh, okay. And yeah. um, and uh, 
So, so in, in making this change, they decided we can ask for it once, make the change as a whole, and then, uh, and then we're done with. As opposed to a, a private company might have said, hey, we'll put, a, we'll put an application out in the cloud. We'll put a database out in the cloud. Mm-hmm. Dip our toes six in. Six months bit. later, we'll do another one. Then six months later, we'll do another one. They didn't really have the ability to do that uh, very easily. So, so the idea was that if they were going to do it, they were going to do it once. And so it had to be planned uh, to, to be a full, not just a full lift and shift, but just a full migration altogether. Wow. So you did a, a big bang. Yeah, yeah, big bang. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just curious that did you do as part of that lift and shift? Did, did you do the? I'm sorry, as part of the big bang move, did you do lift and shift or did you re-architect? Yeah. So initially, the thinking was it could only be a lift and shift because of the, of, you, know, you know, the amount of work, you know, the difficulty, the complexity. Don't introduce anything else that makes it harder. But as time went on, that actually changed. Mm. And it was thought, um, let's also re-architect some things. Let's also uh, change our, our key applications. Let's change our key data models. So, wow. so and they ended up uh, actually refactoring and recoding uh, a, a lot of their, their uh, and certainly their core shopping application that people use online. Mm-hmm. It, there was a lot of uh, uh, changes to that. Um, as well as other areas. So that gave us the, the license or the ability to make changes as well. And so on the, on the data side, on the, especially on the BI side of things, we actually refactored everything. We, we changed uh, ETL tools, we changed uh, uh, the, the database. We went, we went from uh, uh, Oracle to Snowflake as a data, data warehouse engine. Uh-huh. Uh, previously, the the BI uh, systems all ran off Oracle databases, as as well as the uh, as the applications. The applications were moved to Postgres. The the BI uh, uh, databases were moved to Snowflake, and then we introduced Matillion as uh, as an ETL tool as well. And of course, Matillion is not available on prem; mm-hmm. it's only in the cloud and built for the cloud. And so uh, so we decided that we would replace Informatica uh, uh, in the cloud with Matillion. And so uh, because of that, and again, Matillion having a, a different paradigm as to how it works, uh, uh, as opposed to a tool like Informatica, um, uh, there was certainly a, f- a fair amount of re-architecting and refactoring uh, to make that work. So it wasn't a lift and shift. In the end, it ended up being a, a modernization of, of yeah. all the tools and, and uh, what, what is used in, in the cloud. So swapping out Informatica and Oracle to Snowflake and Matillion must have been a cost play in there somewhere, huh? Did, yeah, that, that was part of it. Um, yeah. Initially, when, uh, when uh, Connect for Health purchased Informatica, they purchased, I would say, a limited set of tools and connectors uh, because of the cost. Uh, you know, uh, Informatica mm-hmm. uh, kind of a, in its traditional licensing model, uh, uh, you know, Connect for Health had to be cautious, I guess, of, of how much that cost. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, as time went on, it turned out that not enough had been purchased for, from Informatica. For example, uh, connectors for uh, new databases like Postgres databases uh, uh, or, or for extracting files out to XML data or other types of data. Uh, they were they were limited in how they could do that because uh, you know the full Informatica suite had not been purchased. Connect for Health isn't a isn't a Fortune 500 company. In fact, it's not a big enterprise uh, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so didn't have the people, didn't have the infrastructure to really uh, support it, and didn't have really the, the the means to to purchase everything, and 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 yet still paid uh, you know uh, an annual support cost right to to keep the lights on and keep things running from from Informatica. Mm-hmm. It turns out that we uh, could replace Informatica with Matillion. And even though Matillion was new, Matillion you know, has a, a usage-based model, right, essentially. And we could run Matillion on a, at a lower cost than we could run Informatica, just, just paying the support cost, the annual support cost. Mm-hmm. At the same time with Matillion, we would have all the connectors we needed. 
uh, wouldn't have to purchase anything extra. We would be able to connect to SQL Server, Postgres, uh, Snowflake, whatever we wanted uh, in that sense, they ingest any type of file, that sort of thing. And then we would also, uh, uh, we would also have, I think, uh, a system that was uh, easier for their, their people to work with, mm -hmm. uh, to get up to speed on and to get going on and, and, and that sort of thing. So I think, uh, I think from that point of view, cost was certainly a big part of it. Um, and, uh, and getting something easier to work with was, was another part of it. And then also being able to get Matillion as a full suite, uh, as opposed to Informatica where, where Connect for Health didn't own everything yet. Um, it made it, uh, it made it more, uh, uh, more viable as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sensing there probably was some retooling of skills or an opportunity of retooling of skills. Um, you know, if I'm not running uh, Oracle nodes and I'm not running Informatica nodes um, and, you know, applying patches and all that kind of stuff, was there any shift in roles and responsibilities that the co company realized? No, no, not really. I mean, mostly what we, what we had was uh, people, people who did this work were already in for, they were, I guess you would say former Informatica developers or former Informatica engineers who had mm -hmm. Informatica experience. So they were looking at Informatica processes and then refactoring and converting them over to Matillion and uh, trying to get the same results. Uh -huh. uh, there was also uh, uh, another engineer on the, uh, who worked with us with, uh, with, with one of the other vendors. And that engineer was also uh, had quite a bit of Informatica experience. So what we did essentially is we we use people who already knew Informatica and, and we're, we're good solid EKL people. Uh -huh. We're able to get up and running on Matillion quickly without really any formal training. That's kind of cool. So using online documentation and videos and, and that sort of thing. And then, uh, and then working that way. So yeah. really no retooling except taking Informatica people and turning them into Matillion developers. All right, so if I get this right, you, you migrated and re-architected the data warehouse analytics environment, database, data environment. And then you also refactored the operational application, the shopping app. That's right. Yeah. yeah what, what, right. what drove you towards that? Um, well, yeah. So, so we were involved in that as a company only uh, uh, partly because that was a bigger effort. Uh, uh, there's, a, you know, the primary contractor the, who initially won this contract was CGI and mm -hmm. I had primarily supported those systems, and so, so they uh, they they took responsibility with with C4 of rearchitecting the code. We helped with redesigning the database and and uh, redesigning the database model that supports the new arc, the new application. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the reason they decided to do that was because um, uh, essentially Connect for Health ran. Uh, they, they really have two important processes. One is well, what they call el eligibility, which is, are you eligible to use, uh, are you eligible to be, uh, uh, to enroll with Connect for Health and to get the subsidies and other uh, benefits you get from Connect for Health? Mm -hmm. So the determination uh, process that, that lets you know whether you're eligible and what you're eligible for. And then there's another process, which is now I want to shop for insurance. I want to, I want to get uh, my insurance plans, and uh, and 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 I get to see various carriers' insurance plans. So the eligibility system was already in house and ran on Connect for Health's uh, code base, while the shopping and enrollment system did not. It ran on the legacy product. So there was a lot of interaction between the two uh, that they wanted to bring together. They wanted to control it. They want to be able to manage it better and customize it more and really have full control uh, uh, un, uh, under them as far as that. The old system had been a system that had been purchased from another vendor and it had always been uh, somewhat customized to try to make it work with, they, or work with Connect for Health. So, mm -hmm. so uh, the decision there was really about uh, this is an opportunity now to bring everything together, wow. make it a single system so that you go through eligibility and you go through shopping and enrollment all through the same code base, essentially. Oh, yeah. Connect for Health. Well, that's pretty cool, taking advantage of our cloud migration to do something like that. Right? And that's huge. Yeah, that was, 
that was actually quite aggressive and and very and you know probably the riskiest part of the whole thing, right? Because uh, you're you're not just moving to the cloud, but you're changing your your main application, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, 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 you know you're quite a quite a challenge, right? And something uh, I think, like I said, uh, maybe a lot of companies wouldn't have done it, but mm -hmm. um, again, they took advantage of getting that that approval, and so. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's do as much as we can and to get it. So how long how long did it go? It sounds like a large large project. Yeah, I think initially I would say it was initially uh, talked about maybe two years ago, mm -hmm. where a team of architects was put together to meet every week and discuss, you know, what cloud provider do do they go with and what tools do they use. Mm -hmm. There was a few uh, I think. Uh, you know, uh, key directives that wanted to be met. Uh, for example, I think, uh, uh, you know, container, container based deployments and things like Kubernetes and, and trying to make deployments easier and, and faster was a, was a huge uh, driver for, for what they wanted to do. Um, but, you know, th with those kind of high level concepts in mind, that team started a uh, after after talking for a while, you know, started to put some things together, do some POCs, and you know, determine what what tools are used, and ultimately determine what cloud provider to use, and that sort of thing. So I would say the the work probably really started maybe uh, 15 months before going live. You know, where it would it became a, a real project, mm -hmm. and then so uh, so essentially it took uh, probably overall a good 15 months to have all the teams work together. Uh, you know, Connect for Health being the type of agency they are, they, they don't have a huge IT team within their own uh, organization. So they have to bring together a security team. They have to bring together a, a team to manage operations, a team to develop, uh, help develop applications, uh, a team to help with DevOps, you know, all, the, all that type of work. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, bringing all these teams together, putting people together and all that, you know, happened probably in a, in a good 15 months at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so did you guys do incremental releases, continuous releases or uh, um, a little bit about the execution model? Well, during, during that process of, uh, of building the system, um, that, that, that says that was all done in, in the cloud. And, um, while the current system continued to run on prem or in the, in the federal data center mm -hmm. and because of that security boundary they have, uh, data can, can't go in or out, right? Or couldn't go in or out. So essentially the new system was being built, you know, to be the production system, but without production data. And so at that point, continuous release as, you know, all, all the modern uh, development processes were put in place uh, in the cloud. But again, it was still with, uh, with, with what we would call development or, or test data at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and essentially, once uh, once that authority was given to move data over, that happened, and then, uh, but that only happened maybe a month before, maybe maybe uh, maybe thirty to forty five days before actually going live. So there wasn't much time in the cloud to work actually in a in a real environment with real data. Mm -hmm. By the heart, one of the hardest parts of all this is uh, uh, in another environment. I might have that license, and here we just didn't. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you, see, you got some regulatory constraints that you had to work through. Yeah. yeah. So, so what? What was your aha moment? Did you have a few? You know, what were the, some of the big realizations and aha? Yeah, I, I think a few on the, especially on the BI side, for example. Uh, you know, when we were first looking at what uh, data warehouse to go to uh, and what ETL tool to use, um, I think we uh, we. Uh, you know, the decision had been made after kind of competing uh, with the cloud providers, the cloud provider to use, and and then we 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 were trying to decide well, should we use Snowflake or not as a data warehouse tool? And there seemed to be several advantages to Snowflake uh, for the organization in this case. And then the fact that Matillion would work with Snowflake was was uh, you know another big advantage that that came. And I think. Uh, I think in the end, it turned out that uh, um, uh, those choices were good because they were simple, right? And, I, and what I mean by that is that 
uh, those tools simplify what we've been doing for years uh, in ETL and in, in data warehousing. There's less, uh, less knobs of terms, less, less things to manage, less, you know, you don't think, you know, for example, you don't think much about backups. You don't think much about connectivity. You know, you don't think, uh, you don't have to install much, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're out of the box, they work. And I think an organization like Connect for Health really benefits by something like that being, uh, again, don't really have a big IT department, don't really have much of a, you know, they've historically not had much of that in, in place. And often uh, 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 it was left to an external company. And I think something simple needed to be in place for them because now they're the type of organization that needs to spend all their time either analyzing data or producing reports. And, reg and often what they have to produce are regu regulatory reports or compliance reports. So, mm -hmm. so they need to spend their time doing that, not thinking about how is the data getting from here to here? How's the data being backed up? Mm -hmm. The simplicity of it was really shown when we started to engage with the Connect for Health people, mm -hmm. and uh, and you could see that they looked at the system and they said, "Yeah, this is a lot simpler than what we were doing before." You yeah. know. Yeah, so you were at, um, um, executing in agile mode. Um, did you also do implement some of the data ops principles and practices? In no, we. We, there's certainly things we want to do, but haven't gotten there yet. And that's one uh, uh, where we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, even uh, even uh, putting in a full DevOps uh, type of situation for the reporting and BI side of it still hasn't happened, even though that was on the radar. Mm -hmm. Just because uh, the way they worked uh, was very different from that type of process. Um, so, so, uh, so yeah, so that's still not in place, but, you know, uh, some technical debt there that needs to be taken on at this point. Okay. Yep. Um, and um, give us give us a feel for the process that you that um, uh, Colorado Connect um, went through to select the cloud uh, provider. Did they look at all so three think, or the preconceived notion or what? Yeah, I think I think from their point of view, and I would say this was driven a lot by the CIO, who I think. Uh, when he came in, realized that uh, development was hard and deployment was harder and changing the system was, you know, changing the system was like a huge event, right? Like you, you, I think of the old days when I first came into this business 30 years ago where we took the mainframes down for the whole weekend and <laughs> get things up and running and, you know, that sort of thing and how hard that was. Yeah, I think his sense of it when he came in was that that's what, we were doing. That's what Connect for Health had to go through. So changing the application was really, really hard. So I would say the most compelling reason for the cloud and choosing cloud providers was uh, was how easily could I change my applications and and mm -hmm. where could I use tools where things like Kubernetes and you know the container based uh, applications and deployments and that sort of thing. You know Docker containers. Where could I use that and make uh, make really uh, good use of uh, well gain that advantage that I get from it, which is I can change the system and I don't I don't have to have a an act of Congress to change the system. I can change the system fairly easily. Yep. Okay. So uh, and which provider did did you guys end up? So we so we ended up choosing AWS as the provider. Oh, okay. I okay. think uh, I think primarily it was probably because again a little bit out of our hands, right, as to, you know, that that choice, uh, you know, we were there to assist in uh, making it, uh, showing the benefits of any of the cloud providers. But I think uh, it was really perceived that AWS was uh, going to provide that compelling reason or that that compelling problem was going, going to be solved uh, better in AWS. Yeah, and, and the CIO, um kind of was driving that was that his yeah he was he was yeah i got gotcha. you okay cool um and what's interesting though is that the choosing snowflake and battalion does still give you cloud portability options if you have to right, right. that's right yeah cool um so for the for your you and your team what were some of your aha moments you shared some of the enterprises you know realizations but how about for you guys yeah i think i, I think for us um you know you know, I, I've come kind of come from a long legacy of uh, 
working with a lot of relational databases on-prem like, like Oracle and SQL Server. And over the years, we turned those into data warehouse machines, right? And mm -hmm. data warehouse on those platforms, data warehouses on those platforms. You know, we tried to carefully model them and make them perform and, you know, the whole thing. And of course, those systems, I would say my, my aha moment was I started to think about those systems as, oh, they, they became really good multi-purpose databases, right? They were really weren't intended to be data warehouses, but they were morphed and enhanced in such a way over the years where uh, they could do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They did it okay, right? They did it pretty well. Mm -hmm. My aha moment was then when we went to Snowflake and we started running the Matillion jobs that we had converted from Informatica. And even on small Matillion instances and small Snowflake instances, how much faster they ran. Mm. It was clear that because we were using something that was built just for that, right? You know, uh, Matillion is only built to use Snowflake as its processing engine, right? Not anything else. And Snowflake is built only to do large scale aggregations and sums like we do in data warehousing and not for anything else, right? It's not built for uh, transactional processing or anything, mm -hmm. you know, any other type of uh, relational type process. And so, mm -hmm. Even in using small instances, we were getting uh, jobs to run, you know, uh, 20 times faster. You know, jobs that ran in 20 minutes were running in a minute and a half. Dang. And uh, without, again, a lot of refactoring, without a lot of tuning, just let's take what's there and make it work over here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the same feedback I've gotten from the Connect for Health BI team is, oh, this is so much faster. You know, it's like uh, before we were running Oracle and, you know, Oracle's a, obviously a proven commodity and a solid database, but, mm -hmm. you know, over, it, it's funny how uh, over the years we tried to make it do something it wasn't really intended to do originally. And it did it, it, did it well, yeah. but now that we have these tools that were built specifically for these solutions, how much better they are. They're faster, yeah. easier to work with, and they're built for us, right? They're built so that we can spend time analyzing data and not managing it so much, right? Yeah. Gosh, I, yeah, I, I so remember, you know, my data architect days, trying to, uh, you know, working with the DBAs to design a data model that, that would work in spite of the darn database. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, well, well, well to I'll tell you that. what a great example of that is, and this might be getting into a little too much detail, but, you know, in the last year and a half, two years, uh, there was a lot of struggle with, you uh, uh, you know, some of the ETL jobs running uh, every night and succeeding, you know, and partly because of uh, often transaction log failures, you know, the log would get too big or fill up, you know, run out of space. And of course, in Oracle, you know, if, uh, if I'm rebuilding a table every night, you know, let's say that's not even huge in today's world, let's say it's 10 million rows, but it has to be rebuilt from scratch every night. Well, again, you're hitting the transaction log very heavily in Oracle. And if other things are happening at the same time, you know, you could have problems. Mm -hmm. Often you'd be sitting there trying to move jobs and schedule them at different times, or, you know, things like that. Yeah. And and with something like Matillion and stuff like that almost completely goes away, right? You yeah. don't you don't even think about that, right? It's it's like, is a transaction log full on stuff like I don't know. And I I don't I you know, I don't even know what it does and how it works, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's right. So so that type of management and that's that type of process, now you can all you have to worry about is did I get the process right? I don't have to worry about, well, will it run? Won't it run? How do I schedule it? How do I break it up into smaller pieces to make it run? You know, that kind of thing, which you spend a lot of time doing, right? And uh, and uh, Connect for Health was bumping into those issues and, you know, hitting issues and problems. And, you know, sometimes you you might think, okay, it's a space issue. Well, let's add more space. Well, you know, in, in those old on-prem legacy environments, that wasn't that easy either. And right. it's very costly, right? So, um, yeah. So again, with, with these tools, we don't even think about space, right? We need more space, it's just there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about the Postgres, gosh, easy for me to say, the Postgres decision and the experience there. Yeah, so I think that was, um, you know, again, a re as a replacement for an Oracle transactional system, right, Postgres and just to be clear, what we chose, what was chosen was Postgres Aurora, right? So in Oracle or in AWS, you have several flavors and choices of Postgres. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, so Postgres Aurora was uh, Postgres 
rewritten by AWS uh, to handle uh, uh, transactions differently, right? To, to handle transactions at a higher volume mm. and to essentially use version-based transactioning, uh, transaction process. So when you go to Postgres Aurora, you go there because you're gonna get uh, good high volume uh, transactional database engine with without a lot of contention because of the way they recoded it. Um, and so that seemed to be as good a choice as any for moving Oracle over there and uh, getting out of the Oracle umbrella. I, mm -hmm. I would say is that was also a somewhat of a directive is let's get out of the uh, Oracle ecosystem. So mm -hmm. we could have gone to Oracle and AWS or Oracle RDS, for example, in AWS. Mm -hmm. Uh, that wasn't really one of the options. So it was like, what what other transactional relational database can I go to that will that will be uh, similar to what what I already have? Yeah. And so Postgres Aurora was a, a logical choice in that sense because you know, again, Postgres uh, you know solves the same problem, but Aurora itself <laughs> then allows you to uh, to uh, uh, run at a high volume and without. Mm -hmm contention and blocking and locking because of the way it's been rewritten by oh, that's cool so high volume and low latency huh yeah that's right yeah that's right you know if if you ever look at how aurora works it's uh it actually uh writes every transaction six times right which seems like uh but it's but it's doing it to a to three uh three different clusters and with two machines each so essentially it has a voting system in in place where once uh once it's updated on four of the systems, it says it's good, and uh, and uh, but they don't ever contend with each other. All they do is create a new version of the of the data, and uh, once I have that new version of, of data in place, right? I'm not I'm not in the traditional uh, uh, s system where I'm updating a page and then that page uh, needs to be I need to have that exclusive access to that page, and I'm going to block everybody. Mm. Till I have that, when I have that access and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, uh, uh, what they've done with Aurora is made it a high volume transactional system with less contention. On the other hand, that makes it not a BI system, right? It makes exactly. it a data warehouse system. So, so it made it logical at that point to split. And of course, that's the beauty of the cloud, right? Uh, and uh, when when uh, when uh, Connect for Health went live, and you know, mostly about ten years ago, started thinking about where to go with it. When they bought Oracle, they you you know they bought Oracle. You do everything on Oracle, right? Mm -hmm. You for transactions, you own Oracle for data warehousing, you own it for reporting, because you paid a lot of money for it. And that's what you're going to use. In the cloud, you choose the right tool for the for the solution that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it made a lot of sense to take one set of Oracle databases and go to Snowflake another set of Oracle databases and go to Postgres. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's what happened. So it sounds like the cost savings are there, tangible as well as intangible. You know, we, they are, we, yeah. We um, did they, what did they do with the savings? Did they repurpose it or reinvest it somewhere else? Well, I think essentially uh, it, it, the investment is in, in, in new things in the cloud that weren't there before, right, on-prem. Like, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think they're using Rancher for Kubernetes and, you know, there's a, uh, there was a refactoring of the Oracle Fusion middleware software into MuleSoft. And so, you know, other costs uh, were incurred in different places and mm -hmm. so absorbed in other places. I think, I think in the end, the thinking is that this system and the expectation is that it will be cheaper to run in the cloud. I'm not 100% sure that's been realized altogether yet. I can look at BI and say it's cheaper to run, uh, uh, especially cheaper to enhance, right? If we, were, if we were at a point where we needed to get a new Oracle license or a new Informatica license for some reason, mm -hmm. make it much more expensive than where we are now with them. Yeah. So on the BI side, it's definitely cheaper. I don't know that the verdict is out yet altogether on is it cheaper altogether. I think the expectation is that it, it either will be or already is, but I, you know, it, it but, certainly it was the expenses that were, or money that was saved was put into the modernization of other places. Yeah, and now they, now they can be more responsive to market changes and they're getting value. That's right. They're, they're getting more value. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Mike. Yes. Uh -huh. Hey, um, 
So did they just dive right in or did you go through some type of uh, prove it process with an MVP or how did that work, Carlos? Yeah, there was a, I wouldn't say there was a formal MVP. I mean, there was POCs, you know, uh, you know, for example, somebody would, would, you know, a topic would be about uh, Kubernetes and, and Docker based deployments. And they what so what are we going to use for that? And then an architect would go off and, uh, review what was there, you know, uh, maybe uh, provision it in, a, in one of the cloud providers, uh, see how it works, see see what the cost was, you know, that sort of thing, and and put a PLC together and say, uh, you know, it looks like it's going to work for us or it won't. You know, that happened with Postgres. Let's spin it up. It's easy, so easy, right, in the cloud. Let's spin it up. Let's put some data out there. Let's put some, let's build our schema out there and see what it looks like, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. So, so uh, typically the, the cloud providers love this kind of story where, you know, they, an Oracle app, Informatica app got migrated using their services. Did uh, AWS provide any kind of um, um, motivation or around funding the MVP? Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure I can speak to that. Say that you're, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I don't know that they, I know that there was conversations about things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's important to say that initially, uh, you know, the three major major cloud providers were in play. You know, uh -huh. Cloud, um, uh, Azure, and AWS. And part of the reason was for let's see where it runs better. But there was also that thinking that maybe we can uh, negotiate a little bit better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and you know, tell AWS we're thinking Azure or GCP and tell Azure we're thinking, you know, <laughs> yeah. AWS. We're yeah. not sure yet. In the end, I, I don't know that I can tell you exactly uh, where that went, right? I, I, know, uh, I know on the Snowflake side, for example, we've gotten uh, preferred pricing uh, and they've been able to do, uh, you know, I, I think do, do good for uh, Connect for Health there was a there was there was help uh, early on on the Matillion side and stuff like that in getting this up and running, uh, so so uh, that sort of thing. But but as far as like a formal MVP that was uh, either paid for or funded like that, uh, in in this case, I don't think it really happened that way. Got you. Yeah, got you. All right. So, a lot of good stories, good stripes on the shoulder. Um, tell me. If you had to do this engagement again, what things did you learn that you would do differently to get, reduce the stripes on your back? <laughs> yeah, one of the things we, uh, because of the issue of not being able to put data, production data in the cloud or take it out of the security boundary that it was in until we got the authority to do so. And knowing that that authority would not come more than 30 days before going live. Wow. Um, what, what I think I would have done early on is uh, put uh, a data obfuscation pro project in place that allowed uh, that production data to be obfuscated and, and uh, in a way where it would be acceptable to move it outside of the federal cloud. That mm -hmm. it, and then that would have given a, a, us a real scenario and the ability to run ETL jobs with with volumes of data that were lifelike, mm -hmm. and uh, and with with data that had the same patterns. Mm -hmm. First of all, because I think a, a company or an organization like Connect for All need, needs that anyways, right? Uh, and we we have a project on the books or thinking about it to do that for the future, just because it's needed uh, mm -hmm. all the time. But certainly for this uh, for this exercise of moving over to AWS. Uh, not having access to that real data was a, a huge uh, impediment. I think in the end, uh, it would have solved a lot of problems earlier instead of uh, you know waiting to the end to see some problems we we didn't see otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Did did you feel those or witness experience those problems in um, the building out of the Postgres at the database? At, as well as the BI solution? It both, yeah, yeah, both, because it, going into Postgres, we needed to run a conversion, right? Because mm -hmm. we weren't just migrating the data to Postgres one for one and to the same schema. 
we were actually migrating into Postgres and having to do, run a conversion to support the new application, mm -hmm. the, the application that was being developed. Again, a lot of difficulties there because the application being was in flight, right? It was being developed up to the last moment, right? So, so you never know what your landing spot really is going to look like. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but being able to run that migration and conversion process with real data would have been a huge advantage or more lifelike data. On the BI side, same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, things we were running uh, uh, needed to have data that was coming from carriers, for example, that matched up with data that we had. Uh, the UAT systems just didn't have that type of data or the, the testing systems. And so, so having the ability to say to have more lifelike data would have allowed us to uh, uh, certainly have more confidence in our in our testing early on in the process and in our migration process yeah. as well. That's a, that that is a good compelling uh, um, best practice to share. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Um, uh, one last question. I'm, I'm getting more intrigued with the fact that you at, you did the operational operational app as well as the BI platform. Um, did you do like a mass migration of existing? operational data into the Postgres app? Or uh, how did that migration happen to the, the Yeah, essentially one? that's the way it happened. Um, uh, because of the timing and not being able to pull data early mm -hmm. uh, until we got that authority, we put together a plan that said when we got the authority, we would start pulling data that was collected in that system, but not updated. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of data from outside agencies comes into that system, uh, but it's just sitting there, I guess I would say to be referenced if needed, mm -hmm. uh, but not updated. So much of that data was actually uh, con comprised of bigger uh, tables in that database. Mm -hmm. so we put a plan together to say, we can start moving that data ahead of time because it won't get updated later there'll be a delta of new data coming in, but you know, it'll be smaller, you know, not seven years worth of data at that point. Mm -hmm. So we, we put together, so we, we put together a plan to migrate that data early, then to migrate only the data we needed at go live. And so then that way, uh, a smaller piece of the pie uh, on the, on, at the moment we flip the switch would have to be migrated over to get the system working. And then there was another set of data that could come afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, data that was uh, historical in nature, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing uh, that had been archived, you know. Uh, uh, so, so it was really split up into three different processes. Mm -hmm. so, so at the time we went live, while it was still a large amount of data because all the core shopping and eligibility data had to be migrated at the time, uh, it was still a subset uh, of, of everything, probably not more than 10 or 15% of everything that needed to be migrated. Oh, that's cool. Nice triage approach there. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. What a great story. Um, I got to tell you what, Carlos, I, I'm always amazed at the talent that you bring together and the approaches that you find. Uh, hey, Mike. It, yes. The obligatory human question. Did you run into any um, transformation issues with the team, resistance to the change? Um, you know, not, not a lot. I think, um, I think in general, everything was pretty well received because people had been struggling so much, right? So the team's small, right? Especially on the BI side, smaller team, uh, a big backlog of work, right? Mm -hmm. And so just struggling often without what I would say, visibility into the problems or the ability to, to change them. Mm -hmm. And I think in this new model, uh, the, uh, much of that has been resolved, right? Uh, they, they have so much more visibility into the data and they have so much more visibility into how the process works and then have the ability to change it. So I think, I think the fact that they can actually um, not that we want them to do this all the time, but the fact that they can uh, go out to Snowflake and actually run, they're under the gun, you know, here's a good example. They're under the gun to put out a, a report that has to go to a government agency by five o'clock today. 
and and they're running it and it's not right. They need to run through a few cycles of it to get it right. And uh, they can go out there and spin up uh, an extra large uh, Snowflake data warehouse and and run that report. So instead of it running in 25 minutes, now it's running in, in five minutes and they get their cycles much faster. That was completely out of their hands before, right? And that kind of thing, while probably uh, is a transformation problem often with like a DBA, somebody who manages the system, right? That in fact, a user or an analyst is uh, spinning up a data warehouse, right? Uh, in today's world, that happens, right? And it's a, uh, so the users of it, I think, uh, saw the benefits and were kind of, you know, the ones suffering a lot. The fact that Connect for Health didn't have any on prem people or any people within their organization where, for example, it made their job go away or made it took a responsibility away from them. We didn't bump into that. Mm. For example, if they had had an on-prem or not, I keep saying on-prem DBA, but let's say an organizational administrator managing that, you may have you may have had some resistance. But I think the people that this was delivered to all saw the benefit, right? So, so I think from 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 that point of view altogether, really, really, really well received. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> I think, I think on the application, oh, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry, go ahead, please finish. I'm just going to finish. I think on the application side, my, my, although I'm not as close to it, my sense is the same, right? They had so many difficulties with, with uh, deployments and how difficult they were and how long they took and how they needed to be planned. That even though obviously they're not perfect yet, you know, they're, they're still kind of a, you know, ironing out issues and fixing problems and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think, I think they look at it as well, we're so much better off, right? You know, from that point of view. That's cool. And and how about the role of the CIO and, and other executive leaders? Did they nurture the change transformation or? Yeah, so I think, you know, I work primarily with a couple of people at the organization. One, I mentioned the CIO, Kelly Guthner, who was kind of the initial driver of really the vision of let's move to the cloud, right? Which, like I said, was pretty bold, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I also work a lot with Carolyn Picton, who's the director of, uh, of analytics and business intelligence and reporting. And, uh, you know, Carolyn is uh, uh, somebody I, I know really well and work with a lot. And uh, she's very, um, a good balance, I guess, or a counterbalance in a project like this to what we do, because she's very much a uh, a governance and master data oriented type of person, you know, and and I think in a situation like this, right, that's a really important mindset to have. Mm -hmm. uh, again, she wasn't a technical driver of it, like, uh, uh, and that was more left up to me and, and our team, uh, but she could see the benefits, right? And I think the fact that there was a lot of trust there in where we were headed, and she could kind of balance us on the other side of things by thinking about it more from a governance and, and, and that kind of mindset, I think uh, uh, caused her to actually be very much for this, right? As opposed to resisting it, which mm -hmm. in another organization, I could see somebody in her position being somewhat resistant to it. The fact that they were dealing with such a backlog was one side of it. And then the fact that she could bring uh, this other mindset to it helped a lot too. Right. Oh, that's a great story. Uh, hey, Julie, do we have any other questions floating out there? Not right now, Mike. All right, awesome. Carlos, what a great story. What a great story. Thank you for taking the time and sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, you guys. I'm, I'm glad to do it. Uh, yeah. And everybody that joined us, thank you. And uh, as uh, Julie um, um, has been messaging, uh, take a peek at our events page for upcoming events. And this recording will be in our Chronicles in a couple days. And, and if you have any follow on questions, please feel free to ping us at uh, Great Dana Minds and we'll get somebody on to help answer it for you. Yeah. Everyone Thank you. have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Take care, Carlos. Thanks, Bye. Bye.